everyone, and thanks for coming along to our Color at Camera Image 2020 panel. So I'm Daphne. Um, I've been working at Filmlight for over three years now as a producer, and uh, I'll be the one asking some questions to our colorists today, along with my colleague Andy Minut, who is our color workflow specialist here at Filmlight, and who's been also a colorist for many years in Germany and Istanbul. Hi, Andy. Yeah. Hello, Daphne. Thanks for a nice introduction. So you will be collecting also the audience question, right? Exactly. So I will not talk too, too much today. So I leave that more to you. And so I will collect all of your questions for the colorists in the background and then present them to them. So um, on the 12 nominated films at Camera Image this year, seven were done on Baselight, which is great. Um, and I've got five colorists with me today who each graded one of the films in this year's festival. Uh, they're gonna share the creative insight on the grading uh, while still maintaining the vision of the director and the DP in the process. For each of them, we'll take a look at the trailer uh, before I ask them for a few questions. So let's now meet the colorist. Uh, it's a very international panel. Uh, we got an English colorist, we got a Finnish colorist, an American, a French, a Spanish colorist. So I will say a few words about our colorist and I will give each of them also a chance to say a word or two uh, about the film. They had that camera image. And please don't forget, we will be taking some questions uh, from the audience after. So please log in and pop the question in at any time. Okay, so let's dive into the creative aspect of the work. Uh, I start with Elodie Ister, who is colorist at Arbor. Hi, guys. Hi. 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 Here. So, Elodie, you Thanks began. Me. Yes. Um, you began your career in 2000, working as a color assist in Paris. Uh, you have a roster of credits. Uh, lately, you've worked on The Irishman, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, um, and most recently, you graded the latest feature of Chloe Zhao, uh, which is Nomadland. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, you are here to talk about the grade on this project, uh, which yeah. won the Golden Frog and the Fipretchi Jury Honors at Camera Image. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, yeah, that's congratulations. Um, before I show a little teaser of Nomadland, can you tell us a little bit about the film, please? Yeah, so Nomadland uh, follows the, the story of Fern. Uh, she's a woman in her, in her 60s, played by uh, Frances McDormand. Um, she lives a modern day nomad life uh, through American Midwest, going from state to state, uh, living in her van and looking for seasonal jobs. And along the way, she, will, she meets with other nomads, and through her, we get to meet them and know their stories, too. Nice. Okay, so let's watch the trailers and... Okay, beautiful. Um, so we're moving to some questions now. Uh, can you tell us, Elodie, how did you come into this project? So um, I arrive at um, this project, I arrive at, uh, at the end of it, basically. So I didn't do the dailies. The, they shot the movie a year and a half ago, I think. Uh, um, and uh, Chloe, the director, she's also the editor, and she finished editing the movie at the beginning of this year. Uh, they were looking for a post house. Um, the studio sent me the cut of the movie, so I watched it at home. 
and I fell in love with the story. I fell in love with, with the movie, the, the image, everything was just moving to me. Uh, we set up a call with the DP, Josh. Uh, it was the first time I was talking with him and over the phone, we exchanged idea. We talked about the movie. I told him how much I wanted to work on it and, and it basically happened this way. I was, I was lucky to, to have that talk with him and being able to, to talk about the movie. It, it really, it's, it's a really moving movie, especially when you see it this year for some reason. You know, it's people's story. It was, it was amazing. And, and she's also a super good actress. I love oh, her. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. OK, that sounds like a very interesting collaboration. Hopefully, you will get to work another time with them. Um, and so regarding uh, the grade, what I found very interesting is that the film blurs the lines between narrative and verite documentary. Um, can you tell us how you achieve this naturalistic look? Yes. Um, so it was interesting because, so after that phone call, uh, Josh and I, we met in the DI room. We did a, a look session uh, before we started, started uh, the DI. And uh, I've explored with him different LUTs. Uh, LUT coming from something more filmic or something more naturalistic. And for Josh, uh, he has no nostalgia for film. He was not looking for that. Like from the beginning, he told me, I don't want my movie to look like film. This movie is about the people. He shot with few equipments. There's no hair and makeup team. Um, there's only two professional actors, all the other people, it's, it's them and their life. So, so yeah, naturalistic was what fits the story. Uh, so we use a lot that is very soft. The curve, the tone curve is very smooth. Um, it's a low saturation lot. And um, we basically, uh, in the DI room with the base light, we use only mostly primary color. There's not a lot of windows. We didn't want it to shape the, the, the scene. Um, one of the characters of the movie is the landscape. So there's that too. And, and, and the sun is what lit the movie. There's no like a lot of lights all around. So, so it was really making justice to when and where he shot. Uh, I think they did a lot of work in terms of timing their shooting, uh, where the sun was out, if it's sunrise, noon or sunset. So to that extent, it was going with the image and not forcing a certain shaping. Um, and so with that, we also had a, a lot of work with the highlight and low light. So we played, it was a lot, uh, the grading was a lot based on, on, on curves, manipulating the curves and, uh, and, and, and giving, giving back the reality of the image, which it was a, it was a big question during the DI of what is real or what's not real. Um, Josh shot it with only his lot as dailies. So when he was on set, he was looking at the, the, the scene and then looking at his monitor and he's like, okay, that's what I'm saying. I, I'm, I'm happy with what I see here. His reality a year and a half later in the room might have changed. Like the memory of what you saw might have been different. And my job was for me to understand his reality translated to going to camera, going to my system and putting it back to the screen. And what is on the screen then becomes naturalistic. It may not be the reality, but it's naturalistic. And, and my goal was to hear at the end of the scene from Josh or the director, Chloe, oh yes, that's how I remember the place. Because that's what they wanted, to have something that looks like what they saw. Amazing. Um, and talking about those sunset scenes, I was also wondering, um, what would you say was the most challenging part for you to grade? Was it more uh, the sunset scenes or more the intimate scenes? Mm, so I think when you watch the movie, what is what people will remember is probably the sunset scene because they are stunning, they are beautiful. Um, but that was not the most complicated. Like, <laughs> This is the, 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 the beauty of the nature. And, and, and at times, like you look at sunset in, and, and, or sunrise in, in, when you're in a park or in the outdoor and you're like, wow, this is wonderful. The saturation is crazy. Like if I see that in a movie, it might have been fake, 
but it's the reality of the light. So to me, doing those scenes was pretty easy. I just had to bring that up to the screen and it was, it was to well shot. Yeah, it was well shot, the right time, the framing is well done. Like Josh did an amazing job on that. So, so the most complicated was the anti-mate scene. There's um, a lot of moments where you're inside the van, uh, even if it's during the day or at night, and we had to work a lot on the blacks. We are always at the edge of being at the deepest of the black, but there's a whole range of black that we needed to bring back some details from. So the camera, the, the camera captures that, but it's not something you have right away as soon as you put some grading in. So we had to work a lot of that, a, a, a lot on that. Also, because like I said, it's a very um, um, intimate movie. So when he was shooting inside the van, the space is very small and the, those actors are telling a story that is very personal to them. The idea was not to bring a lot of lights all around them and, and prep the set. They shot with basically exactly. nothing to keep it true to the reality again. So he couldn't really shape the light himself. He couldn't really shape how the fall off of the blacks were falling, you know, on the skin and all of that. So this is a, what was the most challenging for me to recreate and to, and to bring back on the screen. Because it's, it's really, it's like chirurgically going into like the deepest black and finding a nice curl so it doesn't break really. No, having it smooth. Uh, yeah. Spend on the grade, just do you Did remember? How long did you spend on the grid? I didn't. I've um, I think I might I might be wrong, but I think at first it was scheduled for a week, but we ended up working way more than that, a week or two. So in the end, I would say so it's three weeks of work. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I let Andy take over with some audience questions. Yeah, I got um, I got a few. So, so so the first one goes in the same direction. That it was also about how long the grid took and if you can describe the dailies process in a little bit more detail. Yeah, so the dailies, so for this project, I was not part of the dailies again, which usually I love to do that because you create the loop from the beginning and, and, and you work until the end. Uh, this one, it, it happens, like the movie was shot, the cut was locked, I just happened to work directly on it at the end. And, and so it, for this project, it was interesting because I had to go back to the dailies as a reference because for Josh and Chloe, it was what they saw, it's what they liked. But then obviously we, we worked more on that. Their dailies were just a lot. So, so it was a reference point, but I will, it's, it's a different way of working than what I, I'm used to. So, so that's why then I had to refer a lot to them and to understand what they mean or what they, meant when they talk about what is real for them, because I was not there for that. I didn't go on set. I, I didn't travel to the Badlands to see how it looks there. So, yeah. Yeah, that's an in interesting approach in the project. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, and one last question we have is, um, you mentioned the naturalistic lighting approach, but also that you did not use a lot of secondaries. Can mm -hmm. you elaborate on that? Um, so yes, again, the idea. So when we had a, a landscape and it's a wide angle and you don't want to, to fake the light that is from the sun, the sun is the gaffer for the entire movie, basically. So, so you, when you want to have a naturalistic look, you don't go against that. Like we never went against what was shot on camera, whether it was, um, planned or not you you embrace it otherwise it feels too digital to tweak to 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 kind of fake and that was not the idea so and then for the, the smaller part when they are inside the van it's like sometimes it's just lit because the door is open and so it creates naturally some shadows that you you play with but it, you don't recreate the set with some sh some windows you don't pretend that there's a light here and there it's not the case you just want to go with what was shot yeah, and yeah, and I think that works really well in the film. It fe it feels so yeah. I, I guess natural is the, is the right term. It does not feel yeah. any uh, any kind of processed. And um, yeah, again, so like working with George was for that. It was amazing. Like his his approach to it and the way that from beginning till the end, 
from shooting, prepping, shooting, and then the DI room, everything was making sense and in line with his first thought of how he wants the movie to look like. And he shot for a reason, a certain way. So you, you never go against, you're never fighting uh, something that he did on set. It's like, everything makes sense. So I, I was not here to fix anything to that extent. No. So it was a lot of work, but it's like just to go with it. And that, that was wonderful. Yeah, that, that's a great story. So yeah, thank you for sharing the insights. And I think also probably a lot of people agree because it, uh, the movie won the, the Golden Frog. So I think mm. that's... Uh, yeah. It won also at Venice and... The movie Toronto? Venice and Toronto, yes. Yeah, they had a lot of fries so far. It's nice. great, like, watch it. It's wonderful. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you very much. I have one last question coming in here. Is uh, yeah. it's more the technical one? Which camera did they use? Someone? It's specific. an Alexa. Ah, okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, we, we might have more questions by the end, also. So we might ask them at the end of the webinar. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. See you later. Okay, so uh, we'll move on now to colorist Penti Keskimaki. Hi, Penti. Hi. Hi. Hello, everyone. Hi. Penti, thanks for being here today. Um, thanks. So, uh, Penti, you've been a DOP for over 10 years uh, before moving to color grading. You've also collaborated with many cinematographers and others in the industry to try and realize the full potential of color grading. Uh, you work now at Post Control, which is one of the biggest post-production in Helsinki. Uh, and you will be talking today about your work on Helen, uh, which won the Silver Frog at Camera Image this year. Um, so, Penti, can you tell us a bit about the film, please? Yes. Helena is a, it's a film about a, a Finnish painter called Helen Sjarfek. It's about her life, her art, and, and her relationship with, with a younger man called Einar Reuter. And the film starts in 1915. Uh, Helen is in her 50s. Uh, she's living in the countryside, a quiet life with her mother. And uh, she hasn't had any big success as a painter yet. And uh, she's really just painting for herself until uh, this young guy, Einar Reuter, who's a self taught artist and writer, he sees some of Helen's paintings and, and got, fell, fell in love with the paintings. And, and he takes an art collector and patron called Justa Steenman to see Helen in the countryside. And they discover 150 or more than 150 paintings Helen's painted in the, country, in, in the years in the countryside. And Stearman organizes Helen's first solo exhibition. And that's also the time when uh, the friendship and love affair between Einar and Helen starts. And the film follows them from that point. And okay. the, rest of, the rest of it you have to see yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So let's watch a scene from Helen then. Yeah, it's, it's just a like a clip from the middle of the film.
rakas Helen. Vaikea pukea ajatuksiani sanoiksi. Aion palata Helsinkiin. Haluaisin kovasti tavata. Minua ei päästetty sairaalaan katsomaan sinua. Se oli raastavaa. Kirja on muuten edennyt hyvin. Saat ensimmäisen luonnoksen kesällä. Aina ystäväsi, Einar. Um, so, yeah, very beautiful. Um, so let's move to the question. So uh, as I said earlier, you used to be a DOP. Uh, that's a very interesting background. Can you tell us how does that influence your collaboration with DOPs and director? And more specifically, what was the collaboration like with the director, NT and DP Rauno? Well, yes, yes, I, I, I studied cinematography in, in the NFTS in UK in 90s and uh, I then worked as a DOP for 10, 12 years or so before switching to color grading, which I've been doing some almost 20 years now. And yes, of course, the, the, the background as a cinematographer helps the communication with, with DOPs. I enjoy discussing the methods they use to, to achieve the images they bring to the grading room. And that also kind of reveals what they are after and, and makes me understand what, what kind of things we, we still need to do for the images. And uh, collaboration with Antti and Rane, Antti J. Jokin and the director and, and Rauner on kind of the DOP of Helene was really enjoyable and easy because we have actually collaborated on several films before already and done a brilliant job during the shooting. I think uh, the, you know, it was all there, the, the, the color palette, the, everything was really, really nice already when we started grading. And, and yeah, I really enjoyed working on this project. Amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and I was also wondering, uh, the film contains a number of uh, very beautiful night scenes and exteriors. How did you manage the contrast throughout the movie? Well, the contrast, yes, it's uh, the, uh, uh, the interiors of the film were mostly shot on very, with very high sensitivity, 200 and 500 ASA which allowed the DOP to use very low light levels at night to an extent when the candle becomes a light source sometimes. And uh, that of course creates a lot of dark shadows and, and contrast. But we felt that we needed to soften it a little bit. So, so we actually lifted up the blacks a little bit so that it becomes like a surface, a, a, a kind of texture in the blacks, like you, like you see on a painting, um, the black has some texture always. Sorry, my English is difficult. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, we, we soft, softened the blacks, but we also tried to keep all the detail in the highlights everything that was there and and this way we got a little bit sort of softer more fragile feeling and i think it aided a little bit on on on, on, on the mood of the film where helen's character is always very fragile and, and this is a very delicate balance nice and it, it does remind also like a canvas like you say um Okay, and I've noticed also that the storytelling of the film uh, relies on slow editing and slow no camera movement. Um, how would you say that influenced your work? Well, yeah, it's it's true. The film, uh, uh, the style of shooting is is uh, usually that there's a lot of stationary shots, long takes, some very well thought slow camera movements but anyway it gives the audience a lot of time to watch the images uh, actually you could you could look at the images a little bit like you look at the paintings because you can let your eye wander around inside the frame and and uh, 
so you have you have more time to to study the teammates and suck the mood. I think this way it, it contributes to the mood and and uh, not just covering the action, but uh, uh, I, I think it works for this film, the style of it. Definitely. Okay, excellent. So let's hear some of the audience questions now. Yeah, we got some, we got, we got a lot of feedback. And first, I want to just um, forward a few compliments to you, Fenty, so that we have several people just congratulating you on how beautiful these images are. And I guess because this comes from fellow colorists, I guess that's a really nice Thank compliment. You. And okay, where to start? Um, so about the uh, the communication. So, what are your favorite means you are using for communicate for communication about color and look? Well, I I, I prefer preferences, images, movies, paintings, photographs, whatever, where you can actually point your finger on it, that I like the contrast that is on this image, so I like the color of red here. Because talking about images, just with words, I think it's too abstract. You, you know, you can, you can say that, uh, uh, you know, I like a very filmic kind of color palette, but that doesn't mean anything. It means different things to everyone. So, yeah, I, I, I prefer some concrete preferences which we can watch and discuss. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree with you on that because language and color grading is always a difficult topic, even if two native speakers are communicating. Yeah, oh um, yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, there, there's another one which I think is interesting. How do you lift the blacks without them becoming milky or is that okay? Well, yeah, it depends how much you lift them, but, uh, but yeah, and, and it's also to do with the rest of the image. When, when you have something, if you have very high, bright highlights, you can actually lift the blacks quite a lot without even noticing it. But of course, if the dynamic range is very low, then just a slight lift of the blacks would already make it quite milky. Yeah, yeah. I think that's also similar to what Elodie already talked about, that it's always a, a very thin line in the blacks before it should not crush, but it yeah, yeah, some. absolutely. Yeah, 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 I agree. Okay, and let's say the last one. Um, uh, was it challenging for you to grade a movie about a famous painter? Well, yeah, in a, in a way, yeah, I, I, think, I, I guess I was a little bit frightened in the beginning to, to touch such an iconic subject. But uh, I think uh, I realized that we're not trying to mimic her paintings. Instead, we're trying to create a, a believ believable background where these paintings were born. So, so uh, I, I think I think uh, the film is successful in that way, and and uh, uh, I think we were able to honor and respect Helen on the film. We were frightened, but you finally enjoyed it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, and I think you also mentioned to us um, once that um, after the movie premiere that you um, that the that you and your audience you all went to an exhibition with the real paintings from her. And yeah, it was an extraordinary experience because there was a, just across the road from the cinema, or actually it was the National Theatre where the premiere screening was. Then after the screening, we just went across the road and there was the Finnish National Art Gallery. And there was an exhibition of large exhibition of Helen's paintings. So the whole audience was able to see the same paintings in real life after the film. And that was amazingly nice. Yeah, that's a great story. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pendy.
Thank you very much. We'll get back to you at the end. Yep. Okay, so let's chat with colorist Paulino Ibanez now. Hi. Hi. Hello, Paulino. So, Paulino, um, you work at Lucianaga Studio in Madrid. Uh, you've been working in color for 20 years, mainly in features and TV series. Uh, you started your career at the Madrid Film Lab as a telecine um, and then as a DI colorist. And today you are a colorist at Lucia Naga, but also one of the owners uh, of the studio. Uh, so, Paulino, you're here today to talk about the movie While at War. Can you say a few words about it, please? Okay. Uh, yes. While at War is a Spanish historical drama filmed by Alejandro Amenabar. Uh, it tells the story of the events that took place in the city of Salamanca in 1936 uh, through the political and personal conflict of the writer and philosopher Miguel de Unamuno. This is the Great. story. So let's watch the trailer. <laughs> Atención! Hoy queda declarado el estado de guerra en Salamanca. Y con ayuda de Dios, en toda España. ¡Viva la muerte! ¡Viva la muerte! O sea, muera la vida. Yo, que soy experto en paradojas, os aseguro que nunca he logrado entender esa. Vencer no es convencer. Conquistar no es convertir. Venceréis porque tenéis fuerza bruta de sobra, pero no convenceréis porque para convencer hay que persuadir. Todos somos españoles. ¡España! El valor no solo se demuestra en combate. Very powerful trailer. Yeah, very um, epic. Uh, so, Polino, I have a question for you. Uh, you worked previously with director Alejandro Amenabar and DP uh, Alex Catalan. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about your collaboration with them, please? Yes, okay. Yes. Uh, at the beginning of my career, I had uh, worked with Alejandro Menavar uh, doing the dailies of the others and the scene side. Uh, my partner, Noemi, uh, worked with Alejandro Menavar in the color of uh, his previous film, uh, called The Regression, here in Luciernaga. And with the DOP, uh, Alex Catalan, I also worked doing the dailies of Seven Virgins and El Traje. And later, uh, as a senior colorist, I worked again with him uh, uh, in the field called uh, the, Spirit, the Sleeping Boys. Sorry. While at work was the first collaboration between Alejandro and Alex. Uh, they are currently recording a six episode miniserie for the Movie Star platform. And we will also do the collaboration here. Um, speaking of, uh, about the director and the DOP, I can say that Alejandro Menavar transmits a lot of uh, tranquility and is very respectful with the DOP proposal. Uh, when the line of the photograph is defined, uh, he usually let us uh, work alone on the color correction and came from time to time to make a few general corrections. Um, Alex Catalan, uh, the DOP, is uh, very meticulous and likes to have everything under control. Uh, we have uh, to keep a very clear and fluid dialogue that he understands perfectly what we are doing during the sessions uh, and why. He has an incredible eye for the detail uh, and keeps a great concentration during the color correction. 
uh, in addition, uh, the production company, most productions uh, with which we usually work a lot, is very demanding, and the professional team always maintain a high level. Amazing, and it's very nice to hear that you are working on a new show with them. It's uh, generally a good news. Uh, and also, because uh, you mentioned Noemi, um, I, I quite like this story, and I didn't mention it earlier, uh, but Noemi is your part, so the owner of Lucier Naga, so you own um, the place together, which I think is pretty nice. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to um, another question. How did okay. you achieve the look uh, for this film? I mean, how did you convey uh, the seriousness of the topic without making it too cold? Okay. Uh, the action of the films uh, take place in, in summer in the Spanish city of Salamanca. Uh, the buildings of the city are built uh, with a type of clay stone uh, with a particular light and color that we have and we want to, to respect. Uh, the summer in Spain is especially sunny and we had to find a balance between the skin tones and the peculiar environment. Uh, the story itself was already very serious and we did not uh, underline it with a cold uh, look. Uh, we look for naturalism and sobriety. Um, in interiors, uh, Alex uh, relied uh, of, on the natural light coming in through the large windows of historical monuments, and the source of light chosen were candles and or flames of fire to transmit warmth in in a natural way. Uh, obviously, there are situations of light uh, and hours that required a slight cooler image but we try to make it uh, quite natural. Uh, we work at the low lights to generate a slight duotone and that the coldness was in low lights. Okay, nice. And, and you've talked about uh, those uh, candlelight scenes. Uh, how did you approach uh, the grade on those scenes? Okay. Uh, yes, in the in the movie uh, there are several sequences uh, that use candlelight or small lamps, uh, and we know that they are always delicate sequences. Um, but the truth is that Alex Catalan's work on this type of sequence uh, was excellent and took the capture of information to the limit. Uh, we worked uh, a lot. Uh, with best light tools, uh, with the dim, with the balance, with the dark, and in particular with flare, uh, that help us uh, a lot. Uh, many of these sequences are recorded with uh, smoke, uh, fog, um, to soften the low lights, uh, and this soften and added a uh, difficulty to keep uh, an atmosphere homogeneous. Okay. Great, so let's hear some of the audience questions now. Yes, also we have a few um, coming in. So where to start? Maybe with a, a pretty um, a standard one. How long did you spend on the grade? How long did the grade take? Okay, uh, we work uh, for uh, four weeks, I remember. Uh, during the first week, uh, we worked with Alex uh, to define the general look of the field. Um, we considered several options um, until we found the look that we like it best and seem it most appropriate for the field. Um, we tried to make the field have a good contrast, but with uh, good reading in the in shadows without leaving them washed. Um, in addition, Alice wanted to separate the colors um, well and that each thing was uh, in its place. Um, we found a combination from an old lab uh, loot uh, that gave a softness to the image and a certain pictorial sensation to the interiors. Um, in the field, uh, we have uh, several conversations that are like confessions. 
and this softness of the look uh, seemed very appropriate to us to subtract hardness uh, to these intimate uh, moments. Um, then I worked uh, alone for two weeks on the line we had market. And then uh, the last week of collaborating, I worked again with, with Alex to watch the movie together and finish fine tuning all the details before the final presentation to Alejandro and the producers. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's, um, I guess that yeah, sounds, sounds like an intense process, but also, I, yeah, I think probably enjoyable. And also, I see that you already answered a few of the other questions already along the way. So one more is, what references did they give you before starting the grade? Okay, um, the field uh, uh, tell an, an important and rec relative uh, recent historical episode in Spain. And always is difficult when all the people have a, a visual memorial for this uh, moment. Um, and this is a, a, it's a challenge uh, for, for us. Um, we had a first uh, meeting to talk about the project uh, and we talked about some reference, but without uh, going too, too deep. Uh, we wanted to go on with our own way. Um, we talked with Alex, but more about uh, the type of light he was going to do, uh, the contrast he would like to achieve, uh, how the light was going to enter through the large windows, and the use of the smoke uh, to generate texture and dip. It was most a conversation with these uh, key points in mind than our color reference. All right. Thank you very, very much for sharing the insights. Yes, thanks, Paulino. That was great. We will you. see you later. OK. OK, so. Now, uh, let's talk to Tom Russell. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Tom. Our native English speaker in the webinar. It's very international today. <laughs> nice to have you here. So, uh, Tom, you've been a colorist for over 30 years, originally grading on a telecine, specializing in commercials and music video, and uh, you gradually moved into drama. And since then, you've graded over 100 features and TV dramas. Um, so, Tom, uh, you will be talking about the film Falling, uh, which was the opening film at Camille Rimage uh, this year, and which is also the debut feature uh, of actor Viggo Mortensen. So, uh, Tom, can you tell us a bit about the film, please? Of course. I mean, fundamentally, the film is about dysfunctional family relationships, um, sexual orientation, bigotry and dementia which is you know, quite a heavy mix between the two. John Peterson is played by Bigo, is a middle-aged gay man married to Eric, played by Terry Chan, who lived with their daughter, Monica, um, Gabby Vellis, in LA. John's father, um, Willis, played by Lance Hendrickson, is on a visit to his son from his deeply rural farm in upstate New York. He brings with him his extreme conservatism, bucket loads of bigotry and homophobia, alongside the sense into dementia, fueled rage and misery. I think the central thrust of the film is about the disconnection between father and son, and whose worlds are basically so different. This is shown through multiple arguments in public and private in present day LA, as well as you know, most importantly, through intercut flashbacks, charting the breakdown of their relationship over the years. Um, Willis, I think it's safe to say, is a foul man whose racist and homophobic rants are truly shocking um, and exacerbated by his dementia and his inability to distinguish past from present. I mean, 
that said, he can also at times be quite funny and show a certain warmth, especially to his granddaughter, Monica, and of course his horses. The film is about whether there's a possible reconciliation between these worlds, and that's something you'll have to watch the movie to find out. Um, it's a powerful film, shocking, I mean, shocking for sure, but at times funny and also heartwarming. Okay, that's great. So let's watch the trailer. How was your trip out here, Daddy? I heard there was a lot of snow in Chicago. I, I don't live in Chicago. You asked me to come get you. Remember? You said you couldn't handle the farm anymore. The long winters, living all alone there. I would never say that. You did, Dad. <clears throat> You want to take advantage because you think I've lost my marbles. But I didn't. <laughs> Fuck this. I want to tell you something. When a guy my age thinks he has to pee, he already did. Dad, stop. What? Does that rivet you have stuck in your face bother you? It's called a piercing. And yeah, no, it doesn't bother me. Is it a dumbass fashion thing or a dyke thing? Grandpa, why do we always have to start trouble when we get together? Did they know you were a fag in the army? I didn't really know it myself. Maybe that's a good thing. <clears throat> Looks like a goddamn girl. <sighs> Getting a haircut today, mister. I don't want a fucking haircut. Oh, I really don't need your help. Stop trying to run the show. Hear them? Two hearts. You know where the door is, my friend. You are such an asshole. And you are a fucking pansy. Heaven doesn't want him and hell keeps sending him back. Sorry, I brought you into this world so you could die. It's, yeah, fragility of human life. Um, so, Tom, it seems that uh, Viggo Mortensen was very invested in uh, the film. I know that he wrote and he directed the film, but he also starred in it and made the score. Um, did he extend this approach uh, also into the grading? Yeah, he did indeed, and he missed a couple of things. He also produced the film and played piano. So oh. he really was very much involved. Um, in, in many ways, Vigo was an ideal client, I guess, because he had a very clear vision of what he wanted um, in the grade. It was very hands-on. He was in the grade every second of it. Um, but also, at times, willing to listen to both Marcel Zidkamp and the DOP and myself about our views <coughs> and how we could improve the film. Whether he always took notice of this is another matter because he was very focused. Um, he has enormous attention to detail and is extremely demanding as a client. But because he's fundamentally such a, a, a nice, good man, this was never a problem. I mean, when you have demanding clients and fall into categories, some that just are demanding for the sake of it, but Vigo was so good at it that you, you were willing to go the extra 20 miles for him at all times. Um, I'd say that he really knows how to get the best out of people, and that, I think that's reflected in the finished film. Very nice. Um, I, I think it's also inspired by a um, kind of personal story from him. So, I, yeah, I guess it was very important for him. Um, I have another question. So in the film, uh, Vigo used, uh, and you said it earlier, Vigo used fragments of the past and integrate them with the present. Can you tell us how you graded uh, this different period of time? Yes, I mean, we 
kept the we kept the present day LA scenes um, relatively normal, or what I like to call hyper real, in as much as that I don't think anybody really wants to see themselves in the light on the train at the breakfast table. So we subtly enhanced it, not enough that you would notice it or anything like that. But the um, flashbacks we made warmer, more colourful. Um, with a slight, slight, slight wash over them so that it, it gave it a more 50, 1950s, 1960s feel. Um, the difficulty with the flashbacks basically was that they were all in and around the same locations. And, and of course, we had, you know, um, set dressing and costume to help us, but there was also a progression of time through the... Um, flashback scene so we had to differentiate the time within the same color palette and that, that was probably one of the more challenging parts of the overall grade um, yeah the flashbacks covered 20 years so there was a difference and during that time Willis had descended his wives and girlfriends had left him so although we were in the same location we had to make them different at the same time Okay, great. Uh, so you did say also what um, was the most challenging part. Uh, so I will move uh, to the audience questions. Okay, yeah. So uh, first, I also have a compliment from a fellow colorist. She says, uh, so beautiful. And so she really liked the um, images. And so then another question we got is, what kind of inspirations did you have for the look of the film? I mean, it, there was a lot of talking to Vigo and Marcel. There were pictures, which I think has already been covered in this webinar. I mean, you know, pictures t a picture tells a thousand words, and they are so important to a colorist. Um, you know, we can talk about color, we can talk about looks. But you get a picture in front of you, you can say, I like that bit, don't like that bit, let's combine these, and then that gives us a target. And once you've got a target, it's a matter of achieving it, which is often the easier part of the equation. It's, it's getting that vision that is the hard part. And there was a lot of discussion beforehand with a lot of references between ourselves as to how we were going to do the grade, where we were going for, and what we were going to do. All right, yeah. And um, another question we got is, you've mentioned uh, the most challenging part. What part did you enjoy the most? I mean, I haven't mentioned the most challenging part. Actually, the most challenging part is something I haven't spoken about yet, which is a long, long garden scene. Um, there's a, a scene that runs for perhaps 17 minutes during the middle of the film over a very, very long lunch um, out in the garden in L.A., um, the sun comes in, the sun goes out, um, there's a lot of steady cam moves around the table and we spent probably two days, three days grading that scene. Um, it, it's, it's, it's one of the unsung, I think, duties of the colorist. We, when you watch it, hopefully, um, it will just look good. No, there's no drama there, no awards, it will just look good. But only I, Vigo, and Marcel know the blood, sweat, and tears that went into that scene to make it match up. And that, I think, is, you know, it, it, it's not the glamorous side, perhaps, of being a colorist, but it's the grit, it's what you have to do, and it's very often what makes a film work. How long did you say was you? I mean, we, we definitely, did, it was shot over two days, and we took longer than two days to grade it. So we took longer to grade it and later to shoot it. Yes. Um, but it works, it, it works well, but you will never know it works. You know, you'll, you'll never understand the amount of work that went into that, that, that section of the film. Um, and that's the idea. I mean, it, that, that's what we do. That, that's the way it should be. That's your magic, yeah. Yeah, well, I think all fellow colorists can relate to that. It's, it's such an important part of the craft that is often invisible, but one of the most important parts. Um, yeah, I have uh, one more question here, maybe. When do you enhance uh, surface colors and when do you suppress them for the benefit of an overall look? It depends on the look you're going for, basically, but 
you know, very often you will bring out individual colours within a film, depending on the palette of that film. Um, I've just worked working on a film recently when it was gold we wanted to enhance a lot, so that, that was the colour we went for. It was gold and blue, basically, but um, so it, it, it just depends on the film, the subject matter, um, the palette of the film. Um, there's so many different things that go into that question that it's not easy to answer in a few words, but the, you'll generally find that there are certain colours that you want to stick with and enhance and keep as um, subtly prominent as possible without going overboard and giving the film a whole look. Yeah, um, thank you. And I have one uh, very short one maybe to, um, to close on this um, session with you. How, how many grading days did you spend? I think we originally had about 10. We probably overran by about two. Um, I did some work in the background, but I mean, I think we had 10. So it wasn't a, wasn't a lot. You know, you, you have to be focused and you have to get it done with the time available because, you know, sadly, very often that's the economic reality of the world we live in. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Thank See you later. <laughs> so um, we'll finish now with veteran colorist uh, Anthony Raphael. Hi, Anthony. Um, good to have you here. So, uh, Anthony, you're a senior colorist working at SIM in New York. Uh, your credits include Cafe Society, Mapplethorpe, Fahrenheit 11.9. Uh, you've also collaborated with legendary cinematographer Vittorio Storaro on three films. And actually, you will be presenting today uh, Rifkin's Festival, which is the fourth film you've graded in collaboration with Vittorio. Uh, so, can you say a few words about the film, please? Yeah, uh, so uh, Rifkin's Festival is, uh, you know, in the same vein of uh, uh, most Woody Allen films. It's, you know, introspection of of Woody Allen, um, and it's uh, about uh, Morty Rifkin and his wife, and they go to the San Sebastian Film Festival. She's uh, a, an actor uh, in the film, in, in the festival, she's an actor's PR agent, so they're in the festival, but not, and uh, Morty kind of revolves around the festival uh, with great disdain for the film festival and for, you know, the current films. Uh, and he's a student of the older films, black and white films. And what happens is he will go and drift his fan to his fantasy world of these films, uh, uh, Citizen Kane, Breathless, there's, there's several of them. And uh, that is where his, his, the world that he wants to be in. So it's, it's kind of a weird juxtaposition between this beautiful, almost too colorful world that he doesn't want to be in and these black and white, uh, colorless, but vibrant world that he wants to be in. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a very interesting film and it's always a pleasure to work with Vittorio and Woody. Uh, so, I mean, with further ado, if you want to show the trailer. Let's see the trailer then. I actually don't know where to begin. I had to accompany my wife to the San Sebastian Film Festival. She did the press for them. Yes, Philippe. Oh my God, I love his look. He is so chic. I only went because I couldn't shake the suspicion that she had a little crush on this movie director. <laughs> well, we put in quite a day today, huh? You did. You were unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say I wasn't a little uncomfortable about Sue spending all day with Philippe. I ran into Sue this morning. At first, I thought I was interrupting something until I realized it was your wife. <laughs> Since coming here, my mind started playing tricks on me. <laughs> I'm beginning to question everything, what I want, who I am, who in the world am I? Philippe happens to be a fabulous bongo player. Isn't that exciting, Mort? Not since Neil Armstrong walked onto the moon. Are you under any stress? My marriage has been fraying. Can I be frank? My marriage is causing me pain. Sorry about this. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Who are you? Just a friend. Yes! 
with Philippe. I just felt like a woman again, full of passion and lust. I think we should lay all of our cards on the table. How many cards do you have? What's it all about? Is this everything that there is, or is there more? The answers are not always what you want to hear. My shrink says I'm attracted to women who will hurt me. Have you been sleeping with Philippe? Never. Except once. Well, twice. It's been a very enlightening experience. I've had a chance to look at my life over the last few weeks, and I realize I've made a lot of bad decisions. So, do you have anything to say to me after everything that I've told you? It's a nice way to finish with you. So, Anthony. Uh, that's a question I'm pretty sure everyone wants to know. Uh, so you've worked on many projects along with uh, DP Vittorio Storaro. What is your collaboration like? Um, it's, uh, it's, so it's funny because uh, my collaboration, obviously, because we've worked on four films at this point. It's, it's just uh, an evolution. We've gone from, uh, you know, the, from Cafe Society to now it's, it's, it's changed. Uh, we started off, you know, when I first started with Vittorio, it was a very, uh, you know, I could remember walking in to the office where from our first actual meeting about the film and the color and everything. And, you know, I sat down across from him and he, he has a big binder for every film uh, with scenes and color on one scene layout on one side. And then on the other side, he has color references and art references and film references. And he's going through scene by scene and talking to me and telling me about all this, you know, stepping around here and there. And, you know, I'm sitting there with a piece of paper writing stuff and just frantically trying to keep up with what he's talking about. And he stopped me and goes, no, 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 no. He goes, this, we're talking about the story of the film. We're talking about the story of the film. We're talking about, uh, the emotion of the film, the feel of the film. He's like, we're talking, we're not writing, we're not doing any of that. We're, we're trying to understand one another in what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so we started there, which was, I mean, you, you know, walking into a room with Vittorio Storaro and then having him talk to you like that was amazing, you know? And to feel like a collaborator, you're like, oh my God, I'm collaborating with Vittorio Storaro. And then <laughs> so from here on, it's been only more, you know, when we did uh, Wonder Wheel, we had done tests prior. We had talked about the look. When we finished Cafe Society, we went out to dinner and he was like, I think we're going to do another film with Woody. Uh, I got ideas and stuff like that. And then that led to emails and conversations about how the look and fantasy of the film and what the story was about and how the look would translate into the story. You know, because with Vittorio, it's always about emotion into the story. You know, the look uh, has to accompany the story that we're trying to tell. So um, from there, you know, even more, you know, with uh, a rainy day in New York and then now with uh, with Rifkin's Festival, we've always kind of uh, started with, you know, I do the dailies. We also uh, go from there. We we add we, everything, it's, it's always added to one another where we've uh, basically allowed, um, we've I've basically been allowed to be a part of this process. Um, so I guess that's really where, where I would lead it to is, is really like um, I've become a collaborator in this process. Also, I would add that uh, it's myself, Vittorio, obviously Woody, but also Simone uh, D'Arcangelo, who is uh, Vittorio's DIT? We've we've jo we've had this group of collaboration throughout each one of these processes, and it's only gotten better and better each time. Yeah, I guess at this stage now, it's the communication is extremely smooth. Yeah, and just being part of it is really, you know, being included in the beginning from beginning to end is really what's made it special. Nice. Okay, so um, I have a question. Uh, so you did mention it uh, when you uh, gave us a little uh, synopsis of the movie, 
um, but the audience couldn't see it in the trailer. Basically, there are a few black and white scenes uh, in the movie. Can you tell us how you approach uh, these dream sequences and why the choice of black and white? Yeah, uh, so uh, uh, I think it was a choice of Woody to omit the black and white from the trailers. Uh, uh, just because he wants it to be something that people will see and, and to really feel when they see it. Um, so at first when we approached this, the conversation was, you know, we, look, we looked at stills, we sent stills back and forth about all the individual films because he goes into these films and is a part of these films. He's a part of Citizen Kane. He's a part of Breathless. Uh, he's a part of all these other films. And he, um, so the idea was to look at all these films from how they look currently. And that's the way we approached it from a technical, well, at least myself and Simone, we, we had talked about it and, and even Vittorio, we'd talked about it as recreating, right? We're gonna recreate these black and white films. So we started on this process and you know we did the dailies in black and white and everything was fine. And we get into the DI and we're working for probably about a week at this point. And Vittorio turns to me and he goes, I don't feel like this is black and white. And I said, well, you know, I, there's no color in the image. I don't really know where, that, wh where to go with that. And he, you know, it, he said, you know, I don't feel the emotion of what black and white looked like to me. You know, to, in, at, when I used to go and see black and white films, it didn't, this doesn't feel like that. It feels artificial. It feels, just doesn't feel in context. I don't get the same wow of the black and white. So, you know, Immediately, I spent a weekend by myself and actually with Simone, we had collaborated for a weekend, you know, in, in our own time to figure out how to make black and white for Vittorio, to, to create this emotional feel that he wanted. So we, we played for hours trying to figure out what that was going to be and how that was going to look. And we finally settled on something that we thought you know, we hoped was going to be the right black and white for him. Um, and so, you know, we presented it to him and, you know, he watched all the scenes, you know, with this black and white look. And uh, he turned he turned to me and he turned to Simone and he sa said, this is what I remember black and white to be. This is the black and white I wanted. And immediately I was like, oh my God, thank God. Like, you know, this is, <laughs> we're okay, we're okay. We're, we're, we're gonna be great, you know? And uh, that, that was one of those moments, he said, this is the best black and white I've seen, I've ever seen. And, you know, to have that comment come from Vittorio is always just fantastic. So that's probably, yes. you know, one of the, that was probably the highlight part of the, uh, of this film was creating that black and white for Vittorio. Nice, yeah, I guess it's very satisfying to get a compliment like this. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, okay, great. So let's move to the audience questions, Andy. Yeah, I got one. Um, how did you manage those beautiful color saturations? Uh, so, I mean, uh, not to get too technical, uh, but we, um, we, we always work in ACES. Uh, so there's a, a, it's a very big color bucket to work from. Um, if you don't know about it, there's tons of talks about it, if you can look it up. Um, and then, so one of the big things for Vittorio is he's always, uh, he's been chasing this color palette of uh, three strip dye transfer uh, prints, which is which was a process done uh, at Technicolor, uh, you know, back in, you know, the 70s, 80s, and uh, actually early 80s, Whatever. Uh, so this process is what Vittorio feels is amazing and beautiful. So uh, I've created a, a three strip look in base light that has always emulated this color palette for Vittorio. We've obviously from Cafe Society to now, it's been an evolution of this three strip, right? But uh, always the same starting base. And we kind of consider it uh, the film stock that we're shooting with. So even the black and white was shot with this films, this and this color palette, and then made black and white. So we're always getting the same se separation level uh, between the colors. Yeah, nice. So, so basically, it's like creating the process, like a film stock first, and then yeah, yeah. So the, the you know we're we're always shooting through it. We're always looking at it in in aces with this this color stock. 
that that we this digital stock that we use. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, and so now a more specific one. I heard that Vittorio's philosophy is largely inspired by Goethe's uh, theory of colors. Tell you, can you tell a little bit more about this? Uh, yes, yes. I mean, so that, that's a very well known thing that. Uh, that he's been inspired by him. But uh, what I would say is, you know, Vittorio takes that inspiration and makes it his own, right? So he has his theories of what he feels is is the emotion brings from color. And, uh, you know, like anyone, it's, 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 there's certain parts of it that are true to real life that, you know, warm colors are, uh, create one emotion, cool colors create another emotion. It's why we have less color in serious dramas and we have more color in, in, in comedies. It's why a uh, green hue makes everyone uncomfortable. Uh, you know, these are all common things, uh, but applying the emotion to these colors, like anything else gives, gives balance to how you grade and the, the decisions you make. Right? So if you feel, if, uh, you know, I think it, it, it allows an artist to make those decisions. And I think that's the way he looks at it, at it. Well, what color should we have here? Well, what's the emotion? So this is the color that's tied to that emotion. So let's use this color. Um, you know, so I think it's, it's his own kind of personal, but also very universal way of looking at color. Yeah, interesting. So he's basically developed it further and made it, made it his own. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think everyone had, you know, this color is very subjective. You know, you could ask all the other colors on this panel of it, how many times they've sat with someone in a room and said, uh, you know, can you make it more red or more blue? And, you know, you add two clicks or three clicks and that's still not enough or you, half a click is way too much. You know, um, those are all aspects of personal preference, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I think we can maybe invite everyone to the to a big round table. Yes. And so did have, we have time to share a few questions more also from the audience? Yeah, I have a few more if we have, I guess we have a few more minutes. So maybe okay. we'll start with Elodie. Um, I'm in the back. beginning, I have one more specific one for you. Because you mentioned working with the curves, there's the question. Do you mostly work in curves, and can you talk about how this works in a in a technical way? It's not something that I've delved into that much. So it's a good question, actually, because I talk about the curve, but I'm not playing with the curve so much. Not the curve tool. I'm playing with the curve with the idea of working on the shadows using the film grade or the base grade, and that affects the curve of the, the tone map. But um, it, it's more the way I express it, which is wrong. So thanks for correcting me on that. I'm not playing with the curve tool of base light so much. Okay, yeah. Thank you. So the next one, then let's uh, continue to uh, Penti mm -hmm. uh, about Helen. And the question is, is it harder grading a film with not that much dialogue? <laughs> well, <coughs> No, I don't think it's harder, but but of course, uh, when 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 there's less action and less dialogue, you the audience have more time to to pay attention to details, and uh, and uh, of course you you want to do a good job there. But uh, no, I don't think it's really more difficult. Okay, thank you. And one more for Paulino to Madrid. Uh, can you talk more about how you use the flare? Okay, uh, yes. Flare is a, is a tool inside base grade. And when you use the smoke in the shooting, it is difficult to maintain proper and homogeneous contrast. Um, at this point, flare helps us uh, to soften or impress this type of contrast in low light in a very natural and efficient uh, way. Yeah, well, thank you. I think also the other other colors um, here on the panel mentioned that before. And now I have um, two more questions, and I think I mean, they, they are not specific to uh, um, 
to a specific movie, but I think, yeah, we might split them up for um, Tom and Anthony and pick whichever or whoever thinks uh, who wants to answer. Uh, one is, sh should there be an award for colorists? I'll let, Tom I'll let Tom answer that one. I, I, yes, I definitely, I definitely think we should. I mean, I think that um, your input into a film is probably far greater than most people understand, and that your collaboration with the director and DOP is so important. And it can affect the whole film. It, it can make a film successful, um, co and conversely, it can ha have the opposite effect. So I think, yeah, I would like to see that. Yeah, I also agree with that. And then we have uh, another one. What would you recommend a junior colorist study in order to develop a more artistically trained eye? Uh, obviously, uh of fine arts, photography, uh, if you're looking to train your eye, yeah, just soaking in all the art that's around, you know, uh, everything. I mean, it's not just films and television, obviously. It's more, you know, that's the base of, the fine arts are the base and photography are the base for all of it. So, and you find out more about what's happening, you know, you, you see how much things stay the same just in a new medium, you know? So you can find some some threads to 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 uh, anchor your art and your creativity. Can I can I just add to that? I think go to art galleries, see how great artists have used light in paintings. It's a huge education. Um, there is no light in a painting; it all has to be created. I mean, I think that's that, that's what I would suggest. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So that's it from from my side. Okay, fantastic. Well, I'd like to close the session with a little happy-go-lucky question to all of you. Uh, guys, do you have any film or show you would like to recommend to the audience and why also? Shall we do in order? Who want to start? Okay, I can, yeah, I can start. I saw recently a movie that is called The Nest. Uh, it's uh, it's a movie from uh, Sean Durkin and it's shot by uh, Matthias Erdely. It is beautiful. It, it's shot on film, so it's very different <laughs> from the, the movie that I'm that I just talked about. Uh, but it's it's still the that idea of everything is made for a purpose, and they they went for it. And it, the movement, the camera movements are just stunning. And it's it the story takes place in the 80s, and I think they recreated in a way what they, they, the idea of the 80s was for movies, and it's perfectly executed. I, I loved it. Mm. Check it out. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Next. is it my turn? Yes. Okay. Yeah, well, um, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't say this as a colorist, but I, uh, I'll say it anyway. It's a, uh, it's a Roma. A, a film by Alfon uh, Guaron, how, however you pronounce that. <clears throat> it's a black and white film, but I think I think it's a really really beautiful. The black and white in it is is somehow on, on the next level. I mean I mean it doesn't really remind that much of the old black and white films. I think it has a quality of its own. It's, it's a different kind of. It really, I, I really like the curves and shades and everything in it. I, I think it's a beautiful film. Yeah, I, I agree. I was also um, knocked uh, knocked out seeing these this depth in the black and white. And well, no, oh, very yeah. impressive. Yeah. yeah, it's a very good film. Who's next? I'm writing notes huh? because then I have a list for <laughs> what. Uh, okay. Sorry. Uh, I love the color work of uh, Jean Clement Soretti this at uh, Chernobyl. It's not uh, yeah. it's not new, but for me it's uh, amazing yeah. this work and and this 
TV series. Yeah, it's a strong color grade. It's very good. It's Jean Clément Soray, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Anthony? Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, I will give you two. One is a film I worked on uh, called The Climb by a first time director. Uh, it was at Cannes last year. It's a fantastic film about two friends and their lifelong relationship. Uh, it's a comedy, but uh, with more of a, uh, some serious tones to it. It's, it's really great. One of, the, one of the best films I've worked on uh, recently. And then the other is, is The Crown. I mean, I love it. It's one of the best looking shows I've seen. So, uh, so uh, those are, those are uh, good. <clears throat> that's that's I, I guess. Yeah. 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 I had a, I did a, a talk with him uh, a couple of months ago and we were going back and forth about uh, using baseline and alternating and stuff like exactly. that. I can see you chatting with Aza. I <laughs> need long chat. And uh, Tom? Well, I'm, I'm going to go for a, a, a new series. Well, it's out at the moment. It's a Steve McQueen series written and directed by him called Small Acts. It deals with racism in the second half of the 20th century in London. It rings very home. Um, and it makes me happy to watch just like Chernobyl made me happy to watch. Um, I know that's a strange statement to make, but it just makes me think about what good, really good television can do. It makes you think it's done well, it's performed well, and it has a message in it as well. And I think both those shows are possibly my favorites in the last few years. Although I do agree about the crown, I thoroughly enjoy watching that too. Yeah, I'll second uh, Chernobyl as well. What a great film. What a great looking show. OK, so lots of movies to watch now. Well, thanks to everyone. Uh, your insights were very interesting. Uh, I'm sure everyone wants to see the, those movies now. And I hope uh, we haven't done any spoilers. Um, thank you all for coming along and being involved in this webinar. And hopefully, everyone will get the chance to see those movies. Um, and yeah. Thanks for chatting with us. Thank oh, you, guys. Yeah. Oh, um, we've recorded this session, and it will be live on our website, on Vimeo, on our socials uh, in a few days. And we will all uh, email a link. And we will email you all a link, sorry. <laughs> yeah. well, thank, you. thank you to all thank the people in the background. Have a nice day, evening. Ciao.